Welcome to Mac Talks. Our speaker today is Rick Bennett. He's going to talk about his adventure with Glacier National Park. The agenda for Rick's talk is going to be three parts, the physicality of the park, the history, and some insights on visiting today. Welcome, Rick, and thanks for participating in the talk. Thanks, Ron. It's great to be with you today, and my pleasure to uh, share, share with you some things about Glacier National Park. I've been involved uh, with Glacier for 20 years now and currently serve uh, a two-year term as chairman of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. Um, I'm uh, an EMBA grad, EMBA 21, uh, graduated in 2004 uh, from Washington University. And I, I joined the EMBA program at the uh, ripe young age of 50. Uh, it was a really exciting experience. I was going through a transition in my life. I had spent almost 30 years with the May department stores in St. Louis and um, was going through transition and decided to return to Wash U for a couple of years um, to rediscover myself and um, think about the second half of my life. And it was a great experience at Washington University. As part of that time, I wanted to explore um, different things that I love in my life. And one of those is the great outdoors. And uh, so I started spending some time at Glacier National Park in Northwest Montana and decided to put down some roots here and get involved with the park and, and this part of our country. And it's been a, a very exciting adventure uh, for me, as I said, 20 years now, and I'd love to share with you uh, some of those things. So let, let's start with uh, where Glacier Park is. And we have a bit of a map here of the US with, with um, many of the great national parks that you uh, all are familiar with across the country. Uh, Glacier National Park is in Northwest Montana. Uh, it is a million acres of, of national park that was established in 1910. Um, and it is about a hundred miles east of the Idaho border. And it borders directly with Canada to the north. Um, directly north of Glacier is the Waterton National Park, uh, part of the Canadian National Park system. And in 1932, uh, Waterton and Glacier uh, were merged together as an international peace park, the first international peace park in the world, um, and that was approved by Congress in 1932. Uh, there are actually now 200 international peace parks around the world, which are uh, transboundary uh, spaces where uh, national parks uh, adjoin each other. To the south of Glacier Park is a place called the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Uh, and the Bob Marshall is a, a congressionally designated wilderness. Uh, and when you combine Waterton, uh, the Bob Marshall Wilderness and Glacier National Park, you have over 3 million acres of wild space that is contiguous. Uh, and it's a pretty, pretty amazing space. It is, the, the general area is known as the crown of the continent. And that's been a designation that has stuck uh, over, over many years. Uh, next, we'll see um, uh, the Continental Divide as it uh, traverses through um, uh, Glacier National Park. The Continental Divide runs from the northwest to the southeast of the park. Um, and it is made up of, of two uh, mountain ranges that are part of the Rocky Mountains. One is the Livingston Range, which you see here, and adjacent to it is the Lewis Range, and the two of them make up the spine of Glacier National Park, as I said, running northwest to the southeast. And through this space um, runs uh, an iconic um, uh, architectural masterpiece, which is the Going to the Sun Road. And you can see that coming up next. You can see the road running up the left side of this picture. Um, and this is the road running up through Glacier National Park uh, to Logan's Pass, which is uh, at, the, at the summit here, and we'll, we'll explore that uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, the Going to the Sun Road is, was built in 1933, and as I said, it was a, um, a, an engineering masterpiece. It is 50 miles long, uh, and it, uh, it crests the Continental Divide, which you can see here in the V, at about 6,600 feet at, at Logan's uh, Pass. Also through all of this space 
is an area called uh, known as Y2Y, which is Yellowstone to Yukon. And the Yellowstone to Yukon is a 2,000 mile corridor that wildlife um, moves back and forth, all the way from the Yukon down through Glacier, down through Waterton and then Glacier and into Yellowstone. And this is a historic um, a pathway that all of the uh, different species of animals uh, traverse. And it's a very uh, interesting um, uh, piece of work today that is being done across Canada and, and the Northern US to preserve these uh, wildlife corridors, which have obviously been interrupted by huge farms, huge ranches, uh, national highways, both the Trans-Canadian Highway and our own US 90 and 80. And, and these obviously interrupt these corridors. So it's an important piece of work to open up these corridors and, and let the wildlife uh, continue to move back and forth. Uh, the glaciers are um, what, the, what the namesake of the park is. And, and this is uh, representative of one of the glaciers. Uh, when the park was first founded in 1910, there were 150 glaciers. Uh, today, there are 25 left, they are melting. Um, and, and this is not a lecture on uh, climate change, but they are melting. And part of that is um, cyclicality of the environment and part of it is uh, man-made warning. So um, it, it's both, it's not one or the other. And we're not gonna get into that debate today, but the scientific projections are that all the glaciers will be melted uh, by 2050. Uh, this place um, started, this place that we call Glacier National Park, and, and the physicality that you see here in the picture um, started 1.6 billion years ago. And interesting perspective, I think, is the, the recent announcements from the, the Webb telescope talk about the history of the universe being 13.8 billion years. And the perspective that this, this corner of Montana has been here for 1.6 is a, just for me an interesting perspective as to just how old this is. Originally, this was an inland uh, a sea. It was called the Belt Sea. And so when you, when you traverse these rocks, you'll see that they are sedimentary rocks. Uh, lots of algae and crustacean fossils because this was uh, under a sea 1.6 billion years ago. And 60 million years ago, um, the uh, Lewis Range, which I mentioned to you earlier, one of the two ranges that traverses the, uh, the park, um, there was the Lewis fault thrust. And this is uh, when the, the fault in the Earth's crust occurred in this place and created these mountains. And this uh, thrust is, um, is geologically uh, a very special one. It's, it's 350 miles long. So the thrust came out of the ground and pushed the, the, this rock 350 miles, which is what created these, these massive peaks. Um, and then two million years ago uh, was the Ice Age. And the Ice Age started to uh, carve out these mountains from the Lewis Fault Thrust and, um, and, and are what you see today. There are uh, 30 peaks in the park today that are over 9,000 feet. Um, and those were created in the Ice Age uh, two million years ago after the uh, Lewis Fault Thrust, which was 60 million years ago. And then what you see today in the glaciers, those actually formed 6,000 years ago during the uh, glacial age. And what you have here as you uh, traverse these mountains is the Lewis Fault Thrust took all that old rock and pushed it over the top of new rock. So the tops of these peaks are actually older than the bottoms of the peaks because the thrust pushed the old rock over the top. And what you find here is the oldest exposed sedimentary rock in the entire Rocky Mountain chain uh, from north to south. Uh, it's um, really quite amazing to see um, sea life, algae, and crustaceans at, at the top of these mountains. It's a, a very strange thing to be able to experience. Um, so the snowfall here is legendary. And uh, on average, uh, we receive about 1,200 inches of snow a year, uh, every year it comes through. And so plowing the going to the Sun Road uh, becomes a monumental, ta monumental task. And you can see here, this that little dot in the middle of this picture, that is a huge Caterpillar uh, piece of equipment that is um, 
uh, plowing out, and this is about June 1st uh, every year, uh, plowing out what is an 80 foot drift. Uh, it's called the big drift and they come around this bend every year and have to clear this out, 80 feet of snow. Uh, this year, uh, the Going to the Sun Road uh, was not able to open until after the 4th of July. Often it gets opened up uh, late in June, um, but the snow starts falling again in September. And so you only have 90 days to be able to get up across the Continental Divide after it's been plowed out, uh, July, August, September. And then sometime late in September, the snow will fall and they'll close this road up again for, for the next uh, nine months. So it's a, it's a pretty short window um, to be able to, you know, to get up uh, over the Continental Divide. There are uh, 70 species of mammals uh, in this park. Uh, grizzly bears are obviously the most famous, um, but in addition to the 70 species of mammals, there's 250 species of birds. Uh, Glacier Park is famous um, for its, its world-renowned uh, native plant nursery. Um, the uh, scientists here uh, uh, take seeds from all 25 drainages and bring them down to park headquarters where there is a native plant nursery. And they, they grow these seeds so that when damage occurs, whether it's wildfires or, or man-driven uh, uh, man, uh, uh, occurrences, they're able to revegetate those 25 drainages uh, with indigenous seed, with the real stuff that came from there. And uh, it is unique in, in the world of national parks that uh, a park is able to do that. And, and that's right at park headquarters, the uh, native plant nursery. When you combine the 70 species of mammals, which are grizzly bear, black bear, moose, elk, uh, otter, uh, beavers, um, uh, wolverines are, this is the last place in the lower, lower 48 where wolverines still exist, um, lynx, um, endless uh, species of mammals that, that are here. You combine that with the birds, this is the largest intact ecosystem in our entire country. I think there's only one species of animal uh, that no longer uh, exists in the park that once uh, was there, and that is a caribou. Um, other than that, it is the, the largest intact ecosystem in, in, um, in the US. Moving from the physicality a little bit to the history, um, this place has been populated by human inhabitants for 10,000 years. And what's remarkable is in many of our history books, uh, the history of this, uh, this place begins with Lewis and Clark in 1805. And uh, all of the place names that you run into um, and all of the history, um, you know, is, is running just 200 years old uh, after Lewis and Clark. And the fact is the Native Americans have lived here for 10,000 years and have known these places and traversed this, this land uh, for generations upon generations. Originally, it is speculated that uh, the Native Americans got here uh, across a, a bridge, a sea bridge, an ice bridge coming across the Bering Sea uh, from uh, Northern Asia and settled into Alaska known as uh, Eskimos and then uh, down uh, through um, uh, Canada and uh, this part of our country uh, down into the Southwest uh, with numerous Native American tribes uh, populating all of these areas. For Glacier National Park, there are two uh, dominant uh, uh, Native American tribes the first are the, the Salish. The Salish uh, describes several tribes. It is a commonly held language. Um, and the Salish were very spiritual people. Uh, they passed down their stories through the elders uh, in the personage of a wolf. And um, mostly they lived on the west side of what is the park today and in the Flathead Valley. And uh, many of the tribes were nicknamed uh, flathead uh, Indians, uh, but generally all of them were Salish speaking. And what you see here is part of a program that we have at Glacier, uh, which is called Native American Speaks, where uh, the Native Americans are able to come and share their stories firsthand uh, using their tongue and using their place names. 
um, which is a, a very inspiring thing. They, they really enjoy being able to tell their stories on their own. And uh, obviously those of us that, that hear them are inspired by them. On the west side uh, was the Blackfeet tribe. Uh, the Blackfeet were more uh, warriors um, and, and were very territorial. And as I said, lived on the east side of the park. Um, and so the Continental Divide separated these two groups of people. The Salish uh, moved around a lot and um, some characterized them as being nomadic and that's not the case at all. Uh, they were in search of protein. And generally they were in this, in this area called the Flathead Valley, which has got uh, beautiful rivers filled with fish. And bull trout is a, a native uh, species of, of fish that we have here. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a char by, uh, by its nature. Not a, it's not a trout, it's a char. Um, and, and this is what they fed on. The, the salmon would migrate up the, um, up the uh, Columbia River and they fished for salmon and, and chased the salmon uh, spawn all the way over to uh, Western Washington. So these people went from Glacier Park all the way across uh, Idaho and Washington uh, chasing uh, the salmon spawn. And then in certain, in certain years where the, the spawn was not happening, um, they continued to be in search for food and eventually uh, migrated up over the Continental Divide uh, in search of the bison on the east side. And that's when the conflict between the Blackfeet and the Salish occurred. The Blackfeet, as I mentioned, were very territorial and didn't want another tribe there hunting their bison. So uh, these two tribes actually have a history of war uh, between them uh, as the Salish went up over the Continental Divide. Um, the white man came here for the first time uh, in the form of Jesuit uh, priests. And the Jesuits came here and they brought with them uh, smallpox. And um, on some accounts, a third of these tribes were wiped out uh, by smallpox um, at, that the Jesuits uh, brought as they, as they tried to bring um, you know, European religion uh, to this part of the world. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, for many of you that are from St. Louis, all of the Jesuit records, all of the written records uh, that the Jesuits kept from their explorations here are stored in St. Louis at St. Louis University. Um, and so that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, connection for all of us. Um, one of the things that is fascinating uh, about this is that the, the tribal elders passed down their stories from generation to generation through this uh, vision of a wolf. And, um, and the stories are continued to be passed on. And the first written documentation of those stories comes from the Jesuits. And uh, what scientists have been able to uh, observe is that the continuity of the stories for the last 200 years from elder to elder uh, remains uh, completely consistent with what was captured uh, down in writing by the Jesuits. And it speaks to the authenticity of the stories as they've been passed down. And, and often we regard things as not to be factual unless they're written. And, and in fact, the passing of these stories uh, does uh, represent fact. Lewis and Clark came here, as I said, in 1805. Um, and uh, that's when the, the white man's history began here. Um, but this, this place was founded out of three uh, fundamental uh, motivations. And um, we'll show a shot here of Grinnell Glacier. Um, and, and Grinnell Glacier is named after uh, George Bird Grinnell. And he was a, a dear personal friend of Teddy Roosevelt. And the two of them were, were, were true conservationists. Uh, uh, Grinnell, by the way, was a Yaley. Uh, Yale was the uh, most famous place for, the, for their, um, their Department of Forestry, and many of the uh, Western conservation, conservationists were graduates of Yale that came, came out here, and so that history runs uh, very deeply. At any rate, Teddy Roosevelt and George Burnell, uh, George Bird Grinnell were, were close friends, conservationists, and it was their idea that got the National Park System going. And this is a picture of the uh, Grinnell Glacier um, which is um, uh, obviously named for George Bird Grinnell and uh, is on the east side of the park at Mini Glacier. Uh, the park was created in 1910 by President Taft, uh, coming off of Teddy Roosevelt's efforts. And as I said, they were truly uh, conservationists. This place was also uh, founded uh, with commercial interests. 
And uh, Lewis Hill, Louis Hill, of uh, the uh, Great Northern Railroad, uh, built the railroad through this place. Uh, it, it originated in St. Paul, uh, next to Minneapolis, came through these places and, and out to Seattle. And so it was real commercial interests uh, that uh, drove the building of the railroad. And, and many of the buildings that were created here, we'll talk a little bit about the famous lodges, but those lodges were built uh, by the railroad uh, to encourage uh, customers to get on the train and, and come out and, uh, and, and see the park. Uh, you see here Lake McDonald Lodge, one of those, I'll, I'll speak to that in, in, a, in a second. The third uh, motivation here um, is something that we all know, which is manifest destiny. And it was in fact, um, the um, white European culture that said, this is our place and came and took this place from the Native Americans that inhabit, had inhabited here for 10,000 years. So true conservation drove this, commercial interest drove, drove this place and Manifest Destiny uh, drove this uh, place. In 1934, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt as a sitting president in 1934 made the trip here from Washington DC uh, by train and traversed the Continental Divide and went to meet with the tribal elders on the east side and then came back uh, to the west side. And it was there on a Saturday morning that he had a fireside chat and um, announced the, the concept uh, with his quote being, nothing is so American as our national parks. And that gave birth to the idea of, uh, of America's greatest idea that uh, you've heard from Ken, Bar Ken Burns, but that concept Original originated with FDR as the first sitting president to ever visit Glacier National Park in 1934 and coined that phrase. And then um, finally, there is uh, Major uh, William Logan. And Major William Logan was the first superintendent of the park. Um, and it is Logan's past at the Continental Divide that is named uh, for Major Logan. And he, he, he did a lot of innovative things here from a national park standpoint. But he was also the person that helped wrestle this place from the Native Americans. And I think it always gives me pause when I'm there at um, Logan's Pass, mo maybe the, the most quintessential place in the park, uh, named for the first superintendent in 1910. Um, you know, just over 100 years ago, when the Native Americans have been going over this pass for 10,000 years, it just gives a person pause and and uh, makes you want to reflect on, on how long history has been here. Uh, the Salish called this place uh, the place of the mountain goats. Uh, so before it was called Logan Pass, it was known as the place of the mountain goats. And when you go there, you get to see lots of mountain goats. Uh, we, we took a quick uh, look here at Lake McDonald Lodge. It's one of the iconic uh, lodges in the park. There are several, uh, Lake McDonald Lodge, um, East Glacier, uh, the, mini, the Mini Glacier Hotel uh, and the Waterton Park Lodge up in Canada are all built, um, um, were all constructed early in the, in the life of the park. Lake McDonald Lodge actually um, was here very early on as a hunting and fishing lodge. And originally there was no road to get here. So the only way to, to get here was to um, go on horseback and then get in the boat uh, up the lake here. Uh, but it's a wonderful place if you ever get the chance to be in the park uh, would highly recommend um, you stay here. When you think about uh, Glacier National Park today, um, generally you think about uh, West Glacier, uh, which is the, is the gateway to Glacier National Park. And West Glacier uh, is where the park headquarters is. Um, and, and West Glacier is about 40 miles from Kalispell, Montana, which is where you would fly into. And uh, Kalispell is uh, an Indian word. It comes from an Indian word, uh, Kalispe, Kalispe, which means uh, the, the plateau above the Great Lake. And that Great Lake is uh, the Flathead Lake. Um, and so when you, when you get here, you'll, you'll come into Kalispell or Kalispe. Uh, Lake McDonald Lodge here, very historic. Many of you have heard about uh, Charlie Russell, the famous uh, Western artist. Um, th this is where Charlie hung out. Much of his art actually is here at the lodge. He had a cabin, a personal cabin, directly across the lake uh, here and entertained uh, many uh, very famous people um, in the uh, early days of this park. Uh, so all of these lodges are, 
are very historic. Um, uh, next, we'll take a little bit of view here of, of Hidden Lake. Now, this is right at the top of Logan's Pass. Um, when, you, when you stop at Logan's Pass, there's a, a ranger station, and you, you take a, a two-mile hike up to this peak and look down the other side, and you see Hidden Lake here. So when hiking um, Glacier today, there are, I mean, there's a million acres plus two million of adjacent acres, as I've, I've mentioned to you. There's endless places to hike. Uh, but some of the most iconic are this hike up to uh, Hidden Lake. You go to, to Logan's Pass and hike down to Hidden Lake, take the two miles up to where you, this vantage point is, and then you can hike all the way down to the lake. Um, and uh, right across the uh, going to the Sun Road from this lake uh, is um, the High Line Trail, which is probably the most uh, famous trail. And the High Line hooks up to uh, Granite Park Chalet. Granite Park Chalet is, uh, there, there were originally about 25 uh, Swiss style uh, Alp, uh, Alpen uh, lodges where you could hike and spend the night. Uh, there are two left. They are Granite Park Chalet and Sperry. And uh, the, uh, the hike that you take, the High Line Trail directly across the road from this view uh, takes you up to uh, Granite uh, Park uh, Chalet. Um, going to the Sun Road, we've mentioned one of the great things to do uh, if you're going to take a trip and you'll get this view of Wild Goose Island um, when you make the trip is to take a red bus tour. Uh, Yellowstone has their famous yellow buses. At Glacier, we have the red buses. Um, these were all, uh, and our Glacier Conservancy was involved in rehabbing these buses. Um, and so you can take an old time tour. Uh, the, the top of the bus opens up so you get to see all the majesty. Um, and, and there is a lot of congestion in the park today. I'll speak to that in a second. And the, the, the best way to go is to uh, hire yourself a red bus tour and you'll have a docent on the bus be able to describe everything you say, you see. So I would, uh, first time visitors, uh, uh, Lake McDonald Lodge, uh, going to the Sun Road, a red, a red bus tour, go to Logan's Pass and hike the trail there. That's sort of the, the fundamental uh, way to go when you make your first trip here. Um, there are several other iconic places. You can't do them all in one trip, uh, but on your second trip, you probably want to go to Two Medicine. It's on the east side. Fabulous, fabulous uh, hiking. It is a spiritual place for the Native Americans. And then further north on your way to Waterton, you come to Mini Glacier and the Mini Glacier Hotel. Uh, that's where Grinnell Glacier that you saw earlier um, is located. Uh, those would be my uh, second and third recommendations. Um, after you, after you get here. There are endless, anything you can dream of to do outside, you can do here. Uh, hiking is obvious. There's wonderful whitewater rafting, um, skiing in the winter. Uh, fishing is outstanding. It's one of my favorite activities. Um, kayaking, uh, mountain biking, uh, just anything that you can think of uh, to do outside. The camping is wonderful. You can go backcountry camping here. You do need to get a pass. I did mention that uh, the place is crowded. Um, we get 3 million visitors a year now. Um, and uh, when I first joined the Conservancy, it was under 2 million. So in just 20 years, it's grown exponentially. Um, and what's important about that number is it all happens in three months. Uh, I mentioned to you that you can only get across going to the Sun Road in the uh, months of July, August, and September. And so we're pushing a million people through here a, a, a month during those, uh, the, that con constrained time. And we don't have as many visitors as Yosemite or Yellowstone. Uh, they'll, they'll push 10 million, um, but we do it in three months and Yosemite does it all year. So we actually, in the month of July, have more visitors than go to Yosemite, which is a pretty amazing thing. And that congestion has caused a lot of uh, tra traffic on the road and we're working hard to figure out how to manage that best. We've moved um, in the last two years to ticketed entry. Um, that is something that frustrates people uh, because often they don't know. Uh, but if you go online, um, you can find ticketed entry, get yourself a ticket and in you come. And that has allowed uh, to the, to us to um, uh, spread out the traffic. Uh, so we don't have, while it does seem congested when you get here, it's not as bad as it used to be. And it used to be the roads would get so congested, we'd have to swing the gates to close the park. 
And now that we've done uh, ticketed entry, we no longer have to uh, swing the gates because we pulse, we pulse the visitation. Uh, one thing I would note, a little, little tip, that if you buy a ticket to, uh, to the Red Bus Tour or you uh, buy a ticket to um, horseback riding with the concessionaire that does that or you have a night at the lodge, any ticket you have with a concessionaire uh, guarantees you um, uh, a pass on ticketed entry. So if, if you get a, if you register with a concession, that's an automatic way to get, get yourself a ticket and not have to worry about it. Um, so I, I guess I would like to summarize a little bit here with uh, one of my favorite pictures. Um, this was actually uh, taken uh, on my birthday uh, three years ago at midnight uh, at Logan Pass. Um, I'm laying down in the uh, parking lot, looking up at the Milky Way. Um, I, I do have about a 10 second exposure here. So you don't quite see this with the naked eye, but I will tell you, you see about half of it with the naked eye, just laying on the concrete, looking up. When you go on one of these dark sky nights, um, you have to wear a, a little special bracelet because you're, no, no flashlights are allowed. You can't, you can't drive up with your headlights on and it's, it's completely dark. Um, and it is, you, you, you really understand why this place is such a spiritual place to the Native Americans. Uh, the Native Americans, um, you know, um, founded their creation stories here. They, they looked to the night skies, they looked to the mountains, the incredible views, into the rivers, and, and that's where they developed their own view of creation. And when you look into the sky in the middle of the night, it, it just does take your breath away. So this is a, a wonderful, natural, historic, and cultural place. But for me, it's more importantly, a spiritual place. Uh, we all have our careers and our goals in life. And I find that my most creative moments come here, either in the night sky like this or, or standing in a river with a, a fly fishing pole. And I get to contemplate what I wanna get out of life. And I, I look to this place and it is where I find uh, my most uh, stirring inspiration. And I know that um, as my family has, has hiked these, these wonderful trails and these mountains, that they have also found their spirituality here. It's a very special place. And um, the beauty of the night sky, and you can see here next, the beauty of, of the um, natural landscape um, with the wonderful flowers and peaks. It's just awe-inspiring. And um, I hope all of you get the chance uh, to come to see Glacier National Park. It's my favorite place in the entire world. I've really enjoyed um, having the chance to share this with you. And uh, thanks very much, Ron. Oh, Rick, thank you. Um, clearly a comprehensive discussion of Glacier and very meaningful and, and moving description of how you're connected to it. So thank you very much. Uh, we should all get out and, uh, and enjoy it. It's a, it's a remarkable place. Thank you, Rick. Thank Take you, Ron. Bye-bye.